Okay, this will be my solutions for last year's spring 2023 final exam. So I'm just going to go through the whole thing and hope I can do all of this and explain it as best as I can. Okay, starting with the true and false questions, part A. Every stable causal IRR filter has no poles or outside the unit circle, and this one is definitely true. How we define stability is if all the poles are less than one inside the unit circle, then that implies uh, that implies that the system is stable. Unit circle implies by definition how we say it is stable because in the analogy of the impulse response, then you'll get something of the form P to the N, U of N, in which case, if P is greater than one, then it will it will be unstable, it will diverge. So as, as N goes to infinity. Next. The IR filter with transfer function h of z equals one over one minus z to the negative five has a single pole of order five at z equals one. This will actually be false because if you think about what the, the statement is trying to say, then what their what their statement is saying is actually that h of z is equal to one over one minus z to the negative one to the fifth. This has a pole of order five at z equals one but this is not equivalent to the transfer function that is given, which is one over one minus z to negative five. This here actually has five distinct poles of order one, which is not the same thing, so it is false. Next, the discrete time signal x of n equals cosine of pi over 13n plus cosine of pi over 11n is periodic and has exactly 143 DFS coefficients. So I will just say right away that whenever you see these cosines with a pi in there, that is a tell that the sign, uh, the signal is going to be periodic and you're going to eventually need to determine if this DFS coefficient statement is correct. The reason it's going to be periodic is because, well, if you stack up your angular frequencies and circular frequencies, this here is pi over 13. Um, uh, sorry, not omega naught, we'll say omega one. Omega one equals pi over 13, omega two equals pi over 11. Then if I want to solve for the fundamental frequency and fundamental period, then I'll say F one equals one over 26, F two equals one over 22. And this will tell me that F naught is equal to their greatest common denominator, which is equal to, let's say this is, let's say this is, equal to one over two times 13, equal one over two times 11. So F naught is equal to the greatest common denominator, which is one over two times 13 times 11, which is one over 286. And this implies that your fundamental period N naught equals 286, the number of DFS coefficients. So in this case, it was periodic for sure, but it does not have 443 DFS coefficients. And I do mention that um, when we say DFS coefficients, that does mean that they you, there are going to be a lot of zeros in DFS coefficients, but they're still included. So this would be false. Next. Let x of n be a discrete time signal of 200, which is stored in the vector x of MATLAB. Let x of e of j omega hat be the DTFT of x of n. After executing the MATLAB command, the value given by x, x of 2 is x e of j of pi or 1 of 28, okay? So in this case, you have the DTFT, DTFT to be particular which means that you're now working in omega naught equals two pi over the length 256, 256, which is equal to pi over 128. Then uh, what I actually care about is actually when I'm, 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 I'm sampling over 100, uh, uh, sampling over, which actually means that I actually want omega k equals pi over 128 times k whenever I do this FFT. And, Basically, how this works is that 
my first index actually is belongs to k equals zero, which corresponds to x of e to the j, let's say omega, let's say for plus k equals one, for example, which is equal to x of e to the j zero. And this is actually xx of one. So when I say k equals one, this is, uh, sorry, k equals zero here. This, this next one, k equals one, is then equal to x of e to the j omega k equals one, which is according to say x of e to the j pi over 128, which is equal to xx of two. So the, the point I want to get across is that this is the first index of in terms of the xx, and this is the second. And uh, it's you know just shifting your indices because k equals zero is actually the first one, and k equals one the next one. So it's actually a true statement. Next, let x of n be a signal of link 100, and x of k be the 100 point link 100 d of t of x of n. Then x squared of k is always the 100 point DOT of the signal x of n convolved with x of n. So I will admit this is one where I don't really know how to fully explain except to just sort of tell you the solution. So what I'm going to say is um, x of n and let's suppose you have two signals x of n and y of n and you convolve them together. And so let's say x of n is length n and you have y which is length M, M. When you convolve x of n with y of n, even though there's no y of n in the answer, I'm just telling you the general case, then the length of it is going to be n plus m minus 1. And in the case of the particular problem, then when you do x of n convolved with itself, x of n, then it's going to be a length 100 plus 100 minus 1 equals 199. So because of this mismatch between a DFT of length 100 relative to the 199 length signal, there's actually going to be some mismatch. And because of this, the answer is actually going to be false. Next, consider two LTI systems. Let the difference equation of system one and the transfer system function for system two be as such. Um, for system one, determine the transfer function h1 and z of the system. So I'm just going to work this out. So here, I will put all the y's together and x is on the right side. So I'm going to say this is going to be y of n minus 1 16th y of n minus 4 equals 2x of n minus 2 minus x of n minus 4. Now, I'm going to do is take the Z transform and factor it using the time delay property afterwards. So you'll get Y of Z times 1 minus a 16th. Use the time delay property. So I'll get Z to the negative fourth equals X of, Z, X of Z when I factor it times 2 with the time delay property Z to the negative 2 minus the time delay of Z to the negative 4. So if I say that H of Z equals y of z over x of z. This is actually equal to 2z to the negative 2 minus z to the negative 4 over 1 minus 1 16th z to the negative 4. OK, that should be your answer. Next, for part b, for system 2, determine the output of the system y of n for an input x of n equals 3, x of n equals 3 cosine of pi n. And you're going to simplify so there's no convolution. So to do this problem, you need to recall the how we sort of uh, develop the definition of the uh, definition of the z-transform. So we basically said that z is actually equal to e to the j omega hat in terms of the dtft. And in this case, when we say y of n, it's actually going to be the uh, transfer function h acting on x at that particular frequency, e to j omega hat of x of n, where this omega hat corresponds to the frequency in x of n. So I'm going to say y of n equals h of g, e, e, h of e to j omega hat 
at omega hat equals pi of x of n, which is equivalent to saying h of z equals e to the j pi, which is equal to negative one times it by x of n. So anywhere, basically, I see z inside my transfer function, I'm going to substitute in with negative one. So I'm going to take the system, system two that I have and substitute in. So h2 of z equals negative one equals negative one over one plus two j times negative one, one minus two j times one plus two j. And I'm going to get that this equals to one plus two j minus two j minus four j squared equals negative one fifth. So based on what I've said uh, from this, I'm going to get that y of n equals negative one fifth times three. So I'm going to get negative three fifths cosine of pi n because I'm going to take negative one fifth times x of n, and there's my answer. Next, for system two, the impulse responses has the form below, identify A1, 2, 3, and 4. And it should match up to this impulse response, H of n equals A1, A2 to the n, cosine n, and U of n. I will admit this one's a sort of a brute force calculation through to sort of see how this works. And it's going to be through partial fraction decomposition, even if it, you know, it sort of, it might take a while when you're first doing it to actually even see that this is related to partial fraction decomposition and what you're going to get. And if anything, I would think this, this will take some time because you need to get to the right form into what you need to be. So I'll, I'll tell you right away that you're going to do partial fraction decomposition, but um, take your time. So you're going to get c to the negative one over one plus two j, z to the negative one over one minus two j, z to the negative one. And I'm going to split this as equal to a over the first fraction, one plus two j, z to the negative one plus b over one minus two j, c to the negative one. And this is equivalent to saying that a, uh, sorry, this is the same thing as asking for z to the negative one equals a times one minus two j z to the negative one plus b times one plus two j z to the negative one. And from which, this is sort of a pick your favorite way to do this, this partial fractions. So I'll just pick out some ways to do it and you know do it however you want. So I'm gonna say let z negative one equals negative one over two j. And it's gonna cancel out this b term. And what I'm going to get left over is I'm going to get that negative one over two j equals two a. I'm gonna get that a equals negative one over four j in the denominator, which is equivalent to one over four times j itself, using the fact that one over j, uh, negative one over j equals, equals j, if that's correct, yes. So multiply by j, j, yeah, okay. Next, I'm going to say, let, uh, let's use a different color, let z inverse, not m, z to negative one equal one over two j. And I'm going to get here that one over two j equals two b. I'm going to get that b equals one over four j, which is close to saying that this is negative one over four times j. So this gives me a large part of the simplification. And my goal here is now to take the inverse z transform using this result. So I'm going to get that currently I have, let's see, j over four times one plus two j z to the negative one minus j over four times one plus two j z to the negative one. And I'm going to use the rule of the z transform, which is, the first one on your formula sheet, actually. So I'll just show really briefly. 
this one right here, the inverse C transform of this will give a to the n u sub n for any a, really, that for any good a. So in this case, I have a equals negative two in this first case, and a equals two, uh, sorry. Uh, in this case, a equals negative 2j, and in this case, a equals 2j. It's the opposite sign. And by taking the inverse C transform, you'll get that h of n equals j over 4, my coefficient, times negative 2j to the n u of n minus j over 4, times 2j to the n u of n. And my sort of hint of progression here is I need to do everything I can to get enough exponentials that it goes into a cosine eventually. So and I'm probably seeing that this two is probably going to be two to the, two to the n at the end of this. And that, that's sort of my hint so far. So it's sort of coming together, but I just need to turn these j's into e to the j pi over 2, all of them, and I'll maybe I'll find a cosine somewhere in there when I do it. So let's do that. So I'm going to get that this is e to the j pi over 2 over 4. And I'll write this as 2 to the n. And then I'll say, well, I'll write this as 2 to the n. And this negative j is e to the negative j pi over 2n. And then you can write this as u of n minus, and I'm going to get j over 4. And again, I'm going to use probably that j, negative j is e to negative j pi over 2. So I'm going to get that this is e to negative j pi over 2 over four, two to the n. This j is going to be e to the j pi over two n u of n. So I'm getting a bit closer. So now I'm getting that this is two to the n and I have e to the negative j pi over two n my, plus the phase factor. So I'm going to write this as pi over 2n minus pi over 2. So it's actually a plus in terms of the phase because it's a negative. And I have this divided by 4 currently. And there will be, I will write, let's see, let's just put the u of n's away, for example. So the u of n's in the, the u of n's in 2 to the n's will factor. And We'll write this as plus 2 to the n u of n e to the j pi over 2 n minus pi over 2. Am I missing anything else? Divide by 4. So you can see at this time that we do have a cosine, and we're going to steal one factor of 2 from this. And what we're left with is what we're left with is one half because we stole one factor of two. We'll get two to the n, and we'll get cosine of pi over two minus the space of pi over two n minus pi over two u of n. This is sort of my answer, and this is a1, a2, a3, a4. So a1 equals 2, or uh, a1 equals 1 half, a2 equals 2, a3 equals pi over 2, a4 equals negative pi over 2, and that's your answer. So it's a really lengthy question. It's not my favorite, but sometimes you'll get these hard computational problems. Next, consider system 1 and system 2 with respective frequencies and impulse responses. The system's magnitude responses are below. For each system, identify the filter best to describe a low pass, high pass, band pass, or stop band filter, or none of the above. 
So the trick to this one yeah, you can see is that it's from zero to two pi. And so don't deceive yourself. You need to normalize it at pi. This is what you really need to look at. So you need to look at this part and you'll immediately conclude that this is actually just a bandpass filter, which is allowing frequencies near 0 0.5 pi or pi over two. Next, uh, in the same way, you just chop off this part near pi is what you want. And you're gonna see it's negating frequencies exactly at pi over two. And this is a stop band filter. Next, circle the magnitude response for the new filter H3 equals H time convolved with H2, H1 convolved H2. And if you remember sort of the idea, um, when you're ever convolving, then when you're in the new domain in terms of, uh, I think it should be E of J omega, but oh, it doesn't really matter, it's a magnitude. And when you're convolving, it's going to turn into an element wise element-wise products, and there'll be a pi here if you want. So anywhere element-wise that you see zeros, it's going to stay a zero. So you should expect a zero at zero pi, 0 0.5 pi, and 1.5 pi whenever you go through this, whenever, whenever you go through the products. So you're looking for the only natural plot that has those two zeros. And you're going to see, you're going to look through, each of these, and there's only going to be one plot that has this, a zero here, here, one pi and pi, uh, 1.5 pi, and this is your, your, your solution. Next, for each system, identify the corresponding pole zero plot below. So system one has a zero at zero, magnitude at zero and pi. So I'm looking for zeros in the pole zero plot at zero and pi. So you're going to look through these pole zero plots. You're going to look through and which one has zeros at zero and pi as filter D. So that would be answer B, filter D right here. Next, you went to system two's pole zero plot. So you go back up and you're looking for zeros at pi over two. And that's really it, pi over two. So you go down and you look for the only one that has a zero at pi over two, and that would be filter C. And you're done. Next, you will have this unique problem. I wouldn't expect this to be on this year's final exam, by the way, because of how niche it is. It's, just, it's pretty rare to have this type of rare problem consistently. And it's a chat GPT problem. In the lab, you implemented a low-pass IR filter with cutoff frequency 0 0.25 pi radians per second. Having no clue about how to proceed, you may get from chat GPT and whatever, okay? So you can see a lot more, whatever, whatever. Draw the pole zero plot of the filter given by ChatGPT based on the location of the poles and zeros. Does ChatGPT meet the design specifications? Explain why. Okay, let's draw the pole zero plot first. So it has three zeros at negative z equals negative one. So you have zero here, and you're gonna write times three because multiplicity three. Let's use a different color now. And you're gonna have a zero at negative 0 0.4810. Draw it anywhere estimated, close enough. And you'll have one a little bit further to the left with the imaginary component like this, and you're done. Now, does it meet the design specifications? Explain why. And you have to recall their cutoff frequency is actually 0 0.25 pi. So that's actually going to be here. Oh, let's use a different color. Let's use the orange again. And you'll see that. The answer is basically no, uh, uh, no, because the the cutoff frequency, uh, the cutoff frequency pi over four is too far from the action of the the poles at which are at whatever the these two these three, um, from two four too far from those poles at those locations. So in the solutions, you'll say they, they might look at something like close to three pi over four because they're angled the other way. And um, because of that, th it's not a very good filter. Next is the chat GPT filter FIR or IRR. Is the chat GPT filter stable? Explain why. So these are usually instant answers. So it's instantly an IRR because you just need to check if the poles, it's IRR because the poles are away from the origin. 
That's it. That's all you need to say. And it's because it's because of the factorization inside, like the if you study these um, factorizations of these transfer functions, then the only way to get a IRR filter is when and you write is difference equation. You get IRR filters when there's like um you have poles that are not at the origin. And that's really the reason why. So let's go back down. It's IR. And is it stable? And to check for stability, you just check if the poles are less than one, are they inside the unit circle? And the answer here is yes. Unit yeah, circle and it is yes. Okay. Next, determine the transfer function H of Z of the chat GPT filter. So this one's gonna be a lengthy one just based on looking at the zeros and poles. So if you take H of Z, then I'm going to do the zeros first. You'll get one plus z to the negative one cubed it because there's a cubed uh, multiplicity. And as poles, you just write out the whole thing. So it'd be one minus each individual pole, negative 0 0.5954 plus 0 0.4120j. You'll get a z to the negative one times one minus negative 0 0.5954 plus 0 0.4120 j z to negative one times one plus 0 0.4810 j. Is that j? No, it would be just z to negative one. Okay. There's your answer. It's a little bit of a lengthy one, but that's what you get. And next, determine the difference equation for the chat GPT filter. Express the diff coefficient of this difference equation as real numbers. So remember that when you do these problems, everything in the numerator are your x's. And so x of n's of, of some type of shifting, and everything in the denominator is your y's. So let's just get to it. So when you do the numerator, you will get one plus c to negative one in qubit. So you expand that out. Let me just write this. And this will be equal to one plus three z to the negative one plus three z to the negative two plus c to the negative three. And remember when you run the when you run the uh, inverse transform, this is equivalent to saying x of not x. It is x, yeah, x, x of n plus 3x of n minus 1 plus 3x of n minus 2 plus x of n minus 3 because of the time delay property of the D-transform. Next is the denominator one, and this one's a little bit of a, this is a more than a little bit of a lengthy, comp uh, a lengthy computation. So when you do this denominator, how I might do this, I don't have a quick, quick calculator, but if you had a calculator, it might be a bit easier. So let's just do, let's just do the complex conjugate pairs, for example. And what I might get is something like, let's see, when I multiply the convex, the complex conjugate pairs, I get one plus 1.190 z to the negative one plus 0 0.524 z to the negative two times the, the secondary part, one plus 0 0.481 z to the negative one. I'm rounding a bit. If you had exact calculator, you can not round it. I don't think anybody would, I don't, any married grading, I don't think would really care about the rounding too much, so long as you're approximately close. And when you continue to multiply this through, you'll get something like one plus 1.671z to the negative one plus 1.096z to the negative two plus 0.252z to the negative three. And 
you remember that you now convert this back into y's when you run the inverse transform. So you get y of n plus 1.671z to negative, uh, so I'm sorry, the z to negative one goes to y of n minus one plus 1.096y of n minus two plus 0.252y of n minus three. So really the solution to this one is when you just set these equal to each other. I'll write the whole thing, but it's repetitive. You'll get y of n plus what I, exactly what I just wrote. n minus one plus 1.096 y of n minus two plus 0.252 y of n minus three. And this is going to be equal to in the x, the x terms. So x of n plus three x of n minus one plus three x of n minus two plus x of n minus three. So just to reiterate what was done in this problem, basically you're running the Z transforms, you're converting it back using the time delay property and just setting the y's and x's equal to each other in their, in their forms. So the, the computation is a bit rough and hopefully you don't get something this rough on the exam, but good luck. <laughs> Next, answer the questions below. Determine if x1 of n is periodic. If so, find the fundamental period. If not, explain why. And the tell here that this is not periodic is that there's no pi's inside this frequencies. So immediately you're going to say not periodic. Or you can say false because the frequencies, uh, the, the we'll call it the cyclic frequency uh, or the period slash period is irrational. You can tell it's irrational because let's say, let's say you actually ran the analysis. You said omega naught, uh, sorry. You'll get omega one equals 300. And you got omega two equals 500. You do F one equals one by 300 times two pi. So what is that? One by 600 pi. F2 equals one by a thousand pi. Then their greatest common denominator is whatever, and no matter what, you cannot get rid of this pi whenever you, whenever you get their fundamental frequencies and fundamental period. So it'll never be, uh, it will never be an integer. Next, compute the discrete Fourier series coefficients for k equals zero to k to n minus one of x2 of n, express the coefficients in polar form. So here, what matters is you calculate the, you calculate the period because it'll tell you the index of the last, of the last, um, of the last Fourier coefficient. So the first, the first few coefficients are obvious and you just need to calculate the period in order to, to understand the order of it. So I'm going to say omega naught obviously is pi over 12 and F naught equals one over 24 because pi over, over 12 divided by two pi is one over 24. That tells you that my total period is going to be 24. So because I have a DC term and A naught equals 20, I also know that my first coefficient coming from cosine is A sub one equals E to the J times the face pack of uh, it'll be one e to the j pi over three. So just j pi over, e to the j pi over three. And then I know that a of the, my length of my signal 24, right, this is a sub negative one equals a of 24 minus one, a of 23 equals the, the, symmet the symmetry part. So e to the negative j pi over three. So you're, you're free to just not write all this out. You could just write this right part, for example, I just, I just write all the work just because. Next, consider a segment of the DFS of X of N below, determine omega, uh, X of N with a period of N equals six. So it's very somewhat similar in principle to what we just did in part B, and you sort of just want to piece it together based on what you're seeing. So what I'm seeing here is I have a 
let's see, I have, it's periodic up to about this amount. And one, two, three, four, five, six. And after that, it repeats back to two. So I know that I have a DC term up to, let's say two. So when I build my signal X sub n, I can see that I have a DC term here too. And it's going to be another part here on, on this part, which is going to be where I suspect to be a cosine. I don't know the coefficients necessarily, but it's probably going to be a cosine. So, okay. So I'm going to guess it's like 12, because obviously 12 divided by two, I'll get two cosine, but what exactly is the, the frequency of this cosine? So, First of all, I recognize that it's a length six signal. So when I say I talk about omega k, then it'll be two pi over the length of n over, let's say six k. So it would be pi over three k. So this first term is pi over three, two pi over three, and so on. And so repeat back. So this is telling me that because my first, I'm sampling over pi over three k, but my my first index is actually at k equals two, and another at k equals four. But it's a length six signal, so what it's telling me is that a sub two is the first frequency of that cosine, and the next one is a of four, which is actually equal to a of negative two. So this will tell me that it's actually valid to say that this is actually, a of two is actually related to two times, uh, let's say, let's say omega k, omega two, basically is what this cosine will get. So two pi over three n is basically what I'm trying to say. And you can sort of verify when you run this analysis of what the coefficients are. So you'll see that a naught obviously equals two based on what you just did before. You'll get that a two equals six. And when you go backward, you say a to the negative two equals a of six minus four is a of four equals six, and this is actually a, conclu a conclusive answer. So maybe I didn't explain that the best way, but I can sort of see about what it's going to look like. So next, um, consider the eight point DFT HOK and the time domain signal X of N. Sketch the length eight inverse D DFT of H of K. So, here, I will just use sort of the definition of the inverse DTFT. And let's just see how this goes. So I have H of N equals, uh, let's, let's write out the raw definition. So one over N sum over K equals zero to N minus one H of K e to the j 2 pi k n over n. I believe this is correct. J. Yeah. So what I want to do next is just plug in n equals 8. So you get h of n equals 1 by 8 over k equals 0 to 7 h of k e to the j 2 pi over n, so 2 pi over 8 is pi over 4 kn. And I have two choices, basically, on how I want to proceed. I'll just give the, the this, uh, we'll argue the simplest one, where I just plug in n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 5, 6, 7. So what I'm going to get is if I say n equals 0, so I say let h of n equals 0, this will be equivalent to saying h of 1 eighth of every index of k afterward. So what I'm going to get is when I say k, all the k's, there's only two k's that matter. This first one here at k equals zero and k equals four, okay? And so you'll get that this is h of zero, which is eight plus h of four, one, two, three, four, which is 16, e to the, let's see, one eighth, this is n equals four. So you'll get four pi, 
it would just get zero. Okay, so it'll cycle back. So the k equals four and uh, n equals zero, sorry. N equals zero, e to the j zero. So it'd be eight, eight plus 16 equals 24 divided by eight. And this would just be equal to three. And now give you your first part is actually three. Okay, apologies. The other way to do it is to sort of just simplify as best as you can and see what's going to happen in terms of a, a, a one good expression. So if you see about this H of N in general, there's only two H of K's that matter. So you should be able to simplify it in case, and, and hopefully you should be able to simplify it. So you'll get one eighth sum over all of H of K, but there's only two of them that matter. And that's the case where you say, this is H of zero plus H of four, so how should I write this? H bracket, brackets, I'll write this in brackets. H of zero plus H of four. In this case, we plug in K equals four. So that'd be E to the J pi N. And this is equivalent to say one eighth times eight plus 16 e to the j pi n. And this is equal to one plus two e to the j pi n. And this is also equal to one plus two cosine of pi n. So when you graph this, it's actually just going to alternate. So when n equals zero, that's three. When n equals, uh, when n equals one, you just get cosine of, one minus two equals negative one. So you go negative one, you go back up three. And you can go back down one, then back up to three, and back down one, back up three, and go back down one. And that would be your answer of what it looks like. Next, sketch the length a d of t of z of n equals two h of n minus four cosine of pi n. So, this is probably another one where I'm not sure of the optimal way to do this, but I'll tell you one way to do it. So what I have is I have H of N that I just discovered, which I discovered is H of N equals one plus two cosine of pi N. So that'll tell me that Z of N equals two times one plus two cosine of pi N minus four cosine of pi N is equal to, let's see, it cancels and you just get two. So Z of N equals two over the length eight signal. Now, what's going to happen is if I want to convert this, I want to use, for example, the DFT formula. And I want to say that Z of K equals two sum, uh, two sum of n equals zero. Well, I can write this differently. Two sum of n equals zero to seven of two of, uh, we'll write the raw formula, z of n e to the negative j two pi k n over eight. So that is sort of the formula. And when I say z of n equals two, then I'm just going to get two sum of n equals zero to seven e to the negative j pi over four kn. And when k equals zero, everything is just one inside this here, inside this sum. And it'll, it'll just keep on adding all the two together and you'll get one single single 16 at k equals zero to so two times eight. And what you'll observe is that for any other k, they're actually going to cancel. Because let's say that k equals one, you'll get these pi over fours, and you're going to just keep on seeing that there's a complete symmetry between every part on the unit circle, because it's going to partition, they'll cancel all the real parts and imaginaries, and they're going to be zero. You'll similarly say, okay, let k equals two. Then you'll see that you'll only get pi over twos Basically, uh, let's see, you'll get k equals two, you'll get negative j pi over two, and it's going to skip along these parts, and then they're going to cancel. I believe that's correct. And no matter, no matter whatever the k equals three, four, five, six, seven, they're always going to cancel, and you're only left actually with just the k equals zero term, and that would be your sketch. 
So you can leave it like this. If you have a different way of proceeding on this question, that'd be fine. Uh, this is just the simple brute force calculation. You just plug it through and you can see there's an obvious symmetry to the problem. Next, for x of n, determine a sub 1, 2, 3, 4, b 1, 2, 3, 4, c 1, 2, 3, 4, and the f of t butterfly. And my honest um, sort of solution in how to do this one is to actually revisit what happened in your classwork. And I'll just sort of show you what the classwork actually said. So let me show you the result of the classwork is on classwork 12, classwork 25, you basically, if you actually did this or you read the solutions, you kind of, you'll build up whatever this four point, four point, uh, four length F of T is, and it'll tell you exactly how to build this, this F of T butterfly. And I'm going, these are my formulas. You can, you can write it on your formula sheet and I'll just, you know, I'll use these formulas to give you the result and show you exactly how calculations go. Okay. So what you'll do is A1, A2, A3, A4. You first start with the summit, the, the, you start with the even terms. So you'll say that this is X of zero and this is X of two. And now you pair the odd terms, X of one, X of three. Now this, whatever this B1, B2, B3, B4 is what they call, is what they call X, uh, X, well, how do I, let's, let's try to make this capital X if I can. E of zero, this would be X one, uh, X even of one, X odd, of zero and x odd of one. And, and I'm gonna go reference back to this because they'll tell you exactly how this works. There will be x even of zero plus x even of one, x even of zero plus minus x even of one. And what what would this little x? What is this little x? Then you need to find out what your original signal was. So your original x of n was equal to, let's see, it was Zero, negative two, zero, two. Zero, negative two, zero, two. Oh, sorry, I probably could have told you that because of this x zero equals zero, negative two, zero, two. So when I use these formulas, I'm going to say, well, x, capital X, let's try to say, E, how should I write this? We'll write a capital somehow differently, capital X like this. Okay, we'll write it like that if I can. And we'll say that capital X on the even terms of zero equals little x even of zero plus x e of one. So in this case, this is x e of zero, is zero, x, um, let's use a different color so it's a bit clear. This first term is x e of zero, x e of one, and the odd terms in order are x e, uh, sorry, x odd, of zero, x odd of one. This is the uh, this is the terminology of what they mean by zero and one for the x even x odd zero one. So when you calculate this b one term, then you just look for what that means, and so you see x e of zero, which is just zero, plus x e of one. That's also zero. So this is just zero, and this calculation is zero. Next, you go back to your formula sheet, and you go okay, you'll get x e of one, which is just the difference of the two. So you'll see that this is just x e of zero minus x e of one. And this is conveniently just zero because zero minus zero is just zero. Next, so this is 
now zero. Next, x zero odd, uh, x odd of zero. So x odd of zero is equal to x odd of zero plus x odd of one. And this is going to be equal to, let's see, negative two plus two, and that's just zero. So equal zero. Next, x odd of one. So x odd of one is equal to x odd of zero minus x odd. Uh, that's that's not correct. Uh, little x, sorry. So, sorry, I used the wrong notation. So little x, x odd, x odd of one. In this case, you're not gonna get zero because you get negative two minus two and that equals negative four. This is the only case where you get something different. So you get negative four. Next, what is left is to calculate whatever x zero, x one, two, three are. And it, honestly, it's the same thing as what you get the DFT if you tried it. But um, you're going to go back to your formulas. I'm just going to keep referencing this back, and you're going to get these. So you're going to use the values of everything you just got from the intermediate values and throw those in. So I'm going to write them out for the sake of clarity. And I'm going to get, I'm going to calculate x0 now. So x0 equals the even term that you just got. Um, let me see how I want to write this one. We'll call this x e of zero, which is the same thing as b one, plus one times x odd of zero, and you just got that this is actually that you just got that this is actually. Let's see. 0 plus x odd, this is 0. Next, you do x of 1, which based on your formula sheet is equal to x e of 1 minus j x odd of 1. And this is actually minus j times 4, negative 4, and you'll get 4j. So this is actually at, you'll have at this moment, this is zero and four J. Next is left is X2 and X3. So X2 equals, let's see, X E of zero minus one X zero X odd of zero. And this is actually just equal to zero because x is zero. This is zero minus x zero of x odd of zero is also zero, so you get zero. You're left with one extra term, so you're going to get let's see, x of three equals x even of one plus j x odd of one, and that's equal to let's see. 0 plus j x not of 1 is negative 4j. So this would be negative 4j. And that is how you complete your butterfly diagram. So I would recommend, honestly, on this butterfly diagram, just write down the formulas. It's just, just, just do it. You're not going to get anything more than a four-point butterfly. It's only going to be like two or four. Two is the absolute easiest one. Four is, is probably more likely what you might get. But you, you would never give them anything more than that. It's just too complicated. So I hope this helps.